Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Thank you, everybody, for coming. I'm glad to see a lot of people I don't know and some people I do know. Um, this is a talk I, I gave. I'm, a, I'm Melissa Quintanilla. I'm a designer here at Fuse Labs. This is a talk I, I was invited to give at Ohio State University Department of Design. I'm a graduate there. They invited me back as a guest lecturer to give this presentation. The presentation is related to the subject of my thesis that I work there. And it's just an evolution. It's a, it's a personal area of research of mine. And it's just an evolution of what I've been asking since 2005. So back in 2005, when I got to Ohio State, everybody pretty much had one of these. And that's how they interacted with uh, technology. That was the, the computer that people used. A few people had one of these. So it wasn't that common that people had um, laptop computers back then. It was mostly the, the big screen, the mouse, and the keyboard paradigm. But there are also stuff like that, the hug shirt. I'm not sure if you've seen this. This is a shirt that allows people to hug each other remotely. So we were, these are two ends of the spectrum. This is 2005, this is pre-iPhone. We had a very limited way of interacting with technology in which we can just click, we can type, we can see. We couldn't really talk to our computers back then. Nowadays we can talk, we can hear talks back to us. So there's a little bit more of the human senses involved in how we interact with computers. But back then you could click, you could type, you could see. And you could also hug. So there was like this huge, uh, there's a huge gap in there. So I came to Ohio State to get my MFA degree, asking, what is next after the keyboard screen and mouse paradigm? There were a lot of sensor technologies already out, um, a, t a ton of a ton of different sensors, like way of sensing movement, presence, and you know pressure and all kinds of stuff. And meanwhile, we're still interacting with the computers by clicking, typing, and, and looking. Today, we still see that this question is being asked. What is the next paradigm? Is it, is it glasses? Is it something I, I wear? Is it, is it a watch? What is it? So the talk today is about interaction design. And, but it's really about humans, because interaction design doesn't exist without humans in the conversation. If you create an interactive product and nobody interacts with it, it's the same question, if a tree falls in the forest, nobody, nobody hears. So this, this, did it fulfill its promise if nobody interacted with it? And we designed for humans. And this talk was made to be given to design students at Ohio State. But when I say we, I'm not just referring to designers. I'm referring to all of us. Because we work at Microsoft. We release products that people use. And we design for, for those people. So let's talk about how humans interact with the world versus they, how they interact with technology. Do you guys know the hot or not game? So we're going to have a hot or not moment now. <laughs> Sorry if I disappointed. So if I show you this coffee cup, let's say it's a physical coffee cup right here in this room, and I ask you guys, is it hot or not? Probably. If you have the physical cup with you, the first thing you're going to do is maybe touch the cup to see if it's hot, without even looking at it, without even thinking about it. Imagine if you lived in a world where the only way you could tell if this was hot or not was by examining how much steam was coming out of it. Which is, you know, this image, that's the only way you can tell if this is hot or not, is whether there is steam coming out of the cup. It sounds like a very limited world. I don't want to live there. If I, I can touch things. I can feel things. But we actually live there technologically, in our ways we interact with technology. Uh, currently, vision is the sense that dominates our interactions with technology. And focusing so narrowly on vision is hampering our, our ability to innovate effectively. Vision is great. I'm not saying that vision is, is bad. It's amazing that we can see things. But just focusing on, a, on, on vision and language as a way of interacting has been, has been very limiting. So let's look at how we, how we got there, just a brief history moment here. We started in Industrial Revolution. User interface design has deep roots in Industrial Revolution. 
machines were created to modify and act on physical matter. And it was operated by a person, a human. So they were really designed to relate to and interact with the human body. And, and human body meaning it's, it's what it's capable of and what its limitations are. So I'm a human, I have a foot, I can use a pedal, and at the same time maybe I can crank something with my hand. And the, the human body was the, mo the thing that was interacting with those machines. And I could feel my whole body was involved. It was not only my mind. It was probably more my body than my mind back then. So it was all about the body when it started. And then came the information revolution where these user, interfa user interface progressed to, uh, to include these machines that stored and processed information. And then out of a sudden, we were using minimal bodily effort to interact with these with these machines. Uh, I click here, some typing over there. I walk around to another machine. I click, I type. I am no longer one with a machine. I am just doing minimal bodily effort. Everything went up to our minds. And we, we lost that intrinsic ability to relate to these machines via embodied cognition. And I'll come back to embodied cognition, because that's the, the theme of the, of the talk today. But embodied cognition is the fact that your body knows if your cognition is not, not just your mind, it's also your body. So we went from body and, and uh, we went all up to our heads. It was all in our minds. We were thinking while interacting, and our body, body uh, physical actions were minimized. And then came the ubiquitous computing revolution, which was starting to happen when I joined Ohio State. And that's what I, when I started asking, what is, the, what is the next paradigm? We went from one computer, huge computer. The computer was a room. Many users could use it. They had to be specialized users. We went to the PC area, and we fulfilled Bill Gates's vision of one computer in every desk in every home. <laughs> and it became personal. It's my personal computer. It's one user per computer. And now we are in the state that we have many computers per user. I can have a wearable device. I can have something under my skin. I can have something that I put on my ear. I can have glasses. I have multiple devices, all these screens around me. So we went from, but we're still using mostly our minds to interact with these, with these uh, machines. So I went from body to mind, one computer, many users, to one user, many computers. So when you think of future interactions with technology, people still think of this, even though this came out in 2002. I'm going to ask everybody to play along with me here for a second. And if you're eating, it's fine if you don't participate in this. But please hold your hands out as if you are interacting with a minority report type <laughs> interface. Because people see this and they go like, this is great. This is how we should be interacting with computers. The point I want to make, and you are going to get to this, and I'll tell you when to put your hands down. It's, it's very exhausting, unless you're Tom Cruise and you're being paid to work out your biceps to do this type of activity, and this is your job. You're probably not going to be holding your hands up to interact. If this is the main way you interact with a, with a screen, with a, an, an experience, it's going to get tiring after a while. So I'll just give you a few, a few examples. Total Recall, another vision of the future of how we're going to be interacting with technology. You now have this phone implanted in your hand, but you still need to hold the hand up to your ear in order to talk. It's not natural for me to come and say, hey, Rina. I need something from you. <laughs> so it's, it's, not, it's not natural. And we know many of you probably have walked around talking on your phone for a few minutes and have to f switch your hands. It's great for the movies. The movies is a strictly visual medium. It's not so great for humans. So they're doing this because in the movies, it's so much cooler for me to hold my hand up with this projection on my hand and just come and talk to somebody that I can have access to. In real life, it gets really tiring for people to hold their arms out. For instance, this car UI, which was, I used to work on the automotive team. People need a place to rest their hands, like floating your arms in space. I see that lots of you already gave up, but good for the ones that are still there with me. So you need a place to rest your arms. And users, you know, you're the bouncing car and your arms are tired. You need a way to target what you're trying to access there. I don't know if you noticed, but the, the hazard lights are right here, and they're really sensitive. 
So I, I lost count of the number of times I saw Ford cars with their hazards on and people had no idea because that's exactly where they rest their hands. So it wasn't very human uh, thought of, of like how do people are, how are people going to use this thing? They need a place to, to rest their hands. You can put your hands down now. <laughs> so the point I wanted to make. I think so. We'll, we'll try that again. Then it will make you hold it for like an hour with glowing hands. Yeah, it's funny. I don't know if you've like, Darren Lanier is having the consultant for that, and that he's actually kind of came up with it as this is more dystopian user interface. So mm -hmm. then everyone's kind of at least trying it as this interface is a, a future. It did open a bunch of doors for gestural interfaces. So there's there's been pros to Minority Report. But it is for the movies. The movies, it's great to have Tom Cruise movie stuff in the air. and. But in reality, I'm not designing eight hours a day like this. So this has been seeding our populace for ideas of what our future interactions with technology are going to be. And visions such as this have inspired visions such as this. I'm not sure if you're familiar with Corning, A Day Made of Glass. It's this video, a vision video from 2011 in which every, pretty much every glass surface has projections on it and I can interact with it, but I'm still looking, tapping, looking, tapping. Maybe I can speak to it. I can hear back. And this has seemed to lead to this Google Glass. So if I can project on any surface, what if I can project on my own personal surface and it's right in front of me and I have the screen, but it's still very focused on the visual. It's still very focused on the visual sense of this is the only way I can take in information. We've added language. We've added, added the ability to talk to it. It hasn't been very natural till now. But it's still pretty limited. I can, I can see things. I can talk to it. And I have limited touch. I can tap things. I don't get a lot of feel from the touch. You know, we have multi-touch nowadays. So it's been getting progressively better. But there's been this disturbing reliance on visual and language-based interactions with screens, if you look at all of our interactions with technology. And language is one of our last skills to develop. When we're first born humans, language is one of the last things. At first, you're interacting with the world, with your body. You know, you're touching things. You're moving around. And there's been this limitation of, I say the design world here, but it's really the tech world, the, or the human and tech world has had this uh, huge limitation of this ongoing separation between the physical and the, and the mental. Buzzword is NUI, natural user interaction. Everybody talks about it, but then it, it begs the question of what do we really mean by natural? You know, there's a lot of things that people say, oh, this is natural, and I said, is it really natural? And I like to just re uh, rephrase that and call it human. It is, about, it is for a human being. Whatever is natural, it's what's natural for a human being. And in, in the human interface is not just based on vision and, and language. When I'm going through the world, I, I am sensing things in multiple ways. I'm not just talking or seeing. And we need to embrace this new practice in, in human-led design, which is actually very in, in line with the Design Expo's theme of next year just coincidentally. So let's talk about embodied, I don't know, I put this. let's talk about embodied cognition. This is a picture of where people feel emotions. So here's a neutral person. Uh, there's a little bit of blue there, but it's mostly they're, they're pretty neutral. Contrast that to where people feel happiness. It doesn't really happen on, only on your heart or on your head. It happens throughout your whole, whole body. Pretty much happiness happens from the tip of your head everywhere to your, your pinky toes. If you look at shame, you can see that the high energies are on people's cheeks. And when they're ashamed, there's a lot of energy here. But it, it, just, it just goes throughout the whole body as well. And pride is, it, is the puffing up the chest and raising your head. And it's like that's where the energy is. But the energy just goes through your whole body. These are just a, a set of uh, emotions that people feel and where do they register. So the point here is that we don't, we don't think with just our minds. We think with our entire bodies. And the concept of embodied cognition is that our motor, si our motor system influences our cognition the same way that our mind influences our body actions. So for instance, you might, 
you might think you're angry, but maybe you're not, and then that's going to cause a bunch of body, act, uh, body uh, states and also physical actions. And physical actions might cause mind, different ideas in your mind. So body cognition is this idea that we think with our entire bodies, and I will go through some, some examples of that. As humans, we know more than we can create a symbolic account of, meaning we know more than we can, that we can put in words. When you're riding a bike, you're uh, at the same time steering, pedaling, balancing, navigating, but it's hard to, it's hard to explain to somebody. If you want to tell somebody in words how to ride a bike, you probably say, well, you just pedal front and back and try not to fall, and it's just it's hard to explain because it's a body thing, like the body knows. We eventually, we all say, oh, it's like riding a bike, you never forget because you have the memory in your body. I got this picture of the hula hoop because that's a personal story that happened to me. I used to be a good hula hooper when I was about 12, maybe, really, really young, and I didn't pick up, pick up a hula hoop for 25 years. And then one day I, I was somewhere and I had this opportunity and a friend was like, come on, let's do it. And my mind, you know, our minds are always trying to dominate and speak louder. My mind was like, you don't know how to hula hoop anymore. It's been 25 years. And I said, ah, I don't know it. My friend said, please try it. And I said, ah, I don't know it. So I, I tried and it fell. I said, see, I don't know it. I tried again and it fell. I tried a third time. And that thing just stayed up and up and up and up. I was like, I know how to do it. So my body totally tricked my mind. And I like to bring this example because biking, we learn when we're so young that we don't remember what it is to not know how to ride a bike. And I thought I didn't know how to do this, but my body surprised my mind, meaning that it had that information stored there somewhere, and I, I didn't even know it was there, but it was. And with the graphical user interfaces we, we know today, uh, for the first thing that happened is that the physical performance of work has homogenized, meaning that the same body actions that I use to uh, Edit photographs is the same bodily actions I use to communicate with friends and family, is the same bodily actions I use to write a paper. There are pros and cons. The pros are that I can, I can use the same knowledge that my body has across many applications. The con is that it's a limited use of my body, so I'm not going to have the hula hoop moment of, I just know how to do this because I've done this in the past and I have this stored w with me, not just in my mind but also in my body. This weird looking picture is something, I think it's from a book by Tom Igo. It's, a, it's it just stuck in my mind. I saw that back in 2005 when I was starting at Ohio State. And it's the, the graphical user interface's mental model of the user. Because I have this one finger because I can click a mouse. I have one eye because I can see without a lot of depth. And I have ears because I can hear. We didn't used to have mouth. But it's just a very limited view of a human. Like when you draw a human, that's not how you draw it. But if a computer would draw a human, maybe that's how it would draw it. So let's look at some, some ways that people think and process the world with their bodies. So we're, we're going to look at five different ways. Um, activity, meaning uh, physical activity. Performance, which is about expert performance. Space, physical space, visibility, and tangibility. So uh, physical activity. How many of you think better when you walk around? When you really think hard about a problem, you, start, you see people walking around so they can think better. And you see actors walking around when they're memorizing lines. They don't memorize their lines sitting down. When I was practicing this presentation, I was moving around. Just couldn't, couldn't think so well sitting down and without gesturing, for instance. When kids learn math, they are taught to use their hands because it's a little bit easier. Or when you write something down, it's easier to remember what you wrote down because you're activating more centers in your brain when you write something down. I'm personally a, a write-down type of person. I never look, sometimes I never look at it, but just the fact of writing something down helps me process it. And kids are a great example <laughs> about how people learn through doing because the kids, their minds, you know, their, their bodies are there, they're present, they're interacting with the world. And our cognitive structuring requires both physical and mental activity. And we start with the physical as, as kids. And we learn about the world by interacting with it, by exploring it. And the role of gesture. Gesture is seen as 
most people think of gesture as having a purely communicative fashion. So I'm gesturing so that I can make my point to you guys. But there's been a lot of uh, studies that say that gesture has uh, capacity to lighten the cognitive load for the speaker. That even uh, children that were born blind, they, they gesture. And you see people on their, on their cars, and there's nobody in the car. They're probably with their headset, and they're you know, gesturing, or people on their phones. And gesturing just helps people communicate and think and express themselves. So there's been a study done that was uh, comparing interactions, um, comparing microphone use from corded phones to handheld mobile phones to the, the earpiece headset. And it, they found that people had, they were more expressive and more creative and were revealing more personal information when they had the less constraining microphone use. So meaning the fact that the microphone and the speaker was here made them be able to move around, and they were expressing more and disclosing more personal information and being more creative. So the, the lesson learned from here is that the objects that have a less constra constraining interaction styles, for instance, not having your hands stuck in the keyboard, are likely to help people think and communicate. And thinking through prototyping, that's something that we do a lot you know, in design schools, and we do a lot here at Microsoft. And you know, at Microsoft, you can do a, a here we can do a paper prototype, or it can be a, a PowerPoint click through. It can be a fresh code that we're just still in beta, and we're testing with people. And we can do 3D models of things. You can do um, you know mood boards and physical mockups, and it's just a way of it's instead of. Uh, work, instead of talking something through, you're working it through instead of just thinking it through. So you build something, and that artifact that you build becomes the embodiment of the design ideas that sometimes are hard to, hard to explain in words. We see that every day as designers, that we talk about a bunch of ideas. Once we draw it and we show a picture, then we have a lot more conversation. So just these embodiments of ideas is a way to just come to a conclusion by working it through rather than just thinking it through. And the computers impose this mediated activity. So with the computer, as I said, I can click, I can type, I can see, but there's not there's not a lot much more than I can that I can do. So let's talk about performance. This uh, skilled uh, activity. So starting with a quote by our own Bill Buxton, that he says that when operated to, uh, when compared to other operated human operated machinery such as the automobile. The computer systems we use today make this very poor use of our motor and sensory systems. And he makes this funny point that the average, uh, the controls on the average user's shower is probably better human engineered than the computers where we spend so much more time. I like that he says human engineered because it's engineered for a human. So it makes that point of like the human led design. And there's an, there's an account for, we can't forget the body's ability for a skillful performance. So there's some artifacts that we use as an extension of ourselves. So you're not acting on it, you're acting through it. I bring this example because this is, a, this is an interface for DJs that keeps with the physical aspect of the turntables and the mixer. But you can put your digital music through it so you're not in, the screen is off to the side. But you can still leverage that body memory that you have from years and years in, in, in the works instead of clicking in the in some screen. Also, the express, expressiveness of the human hand is not very explored in these computer systems. There's, uh, there are whole professions like sur surgeons and sculptors and musicians that rely a lot on their hands for their work. And you know, in, in computer systems, I like to ask the question, would you, would you trust a, a doctor to perform telesurgery on you using a mouse and a keyboard? Just leave it at that. Uh, so the, the capabilities of your human hand are not very explored. So I can, if I can click and type versus feel and use all the, all the senses I have in my hand, it's very different. And our bodies are capable of motor, motor memory. It's our ability to sense, store, and recall our muscular effort, our physical activity to build skill. 
So that's how you know how to improvise in the piano. That's how you know how to ride your bike. That's how you know how to swim. You just know how to do those things. And it seems very obvious for us as humans to say, oh, I just know how to ride a bike. But you're, there's so much there of so much memory that's just stored in your body from years and years of practice that can be, can be leveraged. And even 25 years later, your body still has that memory within it. And these are not being explored in the, the computer systems we use today. One of the mo most successful commercial uh, uses today of the fact of, of your motor memory are the, uh, the controllers, the game controllers. The fact that you don't have to look at it and you just know how to use it and with time you get more practice with, uh, with where things are and how to use it. So you're leveraging the body-centric experiential cognition. And in computer uh, interfaces, your reflective reasoning is too slow. So when you're, uh, for instance, uh, there's a lot of daily activities that, that require these bo rapid body um, responses. For instance, when you're playing a sport or when you're driving a car, that's probably why younger drivers are getting more accidents than more experienced drivers, because they ju they're just more used to quickly uh, getting out of a situation versus if you had a computer interface in front of you, it would take more time. But first, you have to remember, where is that thing under the menu, and how do I get there? And then you can take your action. So let's think of uh, space. We humans, we use space to think. If I can lay things out in front of me, I can sort them. I can see connections that I wouldn't be able to see if I was just jumping through tabs. When I was working on this particular presentation, I did one of these things, because I had slides, and the slides you can see one at a time, and you can't really see where things connect. And I wanted to see what are the clusters that I have, and I had to put things out in space, look at them, and then you have a lot of cement, um, spatial semantic systems that you can use to present that back. I could, do, I could have done, I did a deck, I could have done an infographic, I could have done a timeline. I could have put them in buckets. There are different ways you can express information, but as a human to think, I had to put everything out in front of me. And humans use space also to store information. The car is a good example because I can, I can actually interact with my car without my car even being here. I can be like, oh, I can honk my horn. I can turn on my blinks, my signal. I can turn on my wiper. I can turn up my volume. I can use my clutch. So I know where everything is, because the, when you're driving a car, you're visually impaired, and you're partially cognitively impaired, because your eyes are supposed to be on the road. Your mind is supposed to be on drive. And so that's why the, the spatial, your idea of space inside a car is so important. And also the, the tactile feedback, which we'll get to. It's also important in the car. And humans, uh, they memorize by associating physical locations to ment with mental concepts. Um, so there's this technique called the memory palace technique. You're familiar with it? Yeah. Yeah, so I wasn't, I wasn't familiar with it. But apparently, there is a, there's, there's such a thing as a memory championship. And there's this guy called Dominic O'Brien. He's been world memory champion eight times. And, he uses the memory palace technique to memorize 50-some decks of cards, which is 2,800 cards, after seeing them just once. So it's amazing what the human is capable of when we start uh, connecting space with mind and, and body. So the way the memory palace technique works, you have to pick a place that you know really well. So it could be your workplace or your home, a place that you can mentally walk through that place, and you can recognize some landmarks. So I walk. I, so I come home, there's a door, I look to the right, there's a picture. And they even say that you should think of a place and have a, a way in which you, you scan the place, so always from left to right. And the more pieces of this place that you can remember, you always associate one thing you want to remember to that space. So let's say I'm trying to remember my grocery list, which is a pretty simple ex uh, example. But I look at my door and I think bacon. I open my door, I look to the right, I think eggs. I look to my window, I think milk. And then if you do that en enough times, then you can build up your memory to more of the usual seven items that humans can remember without associations. And the, monitor, the computer monitor that we use gives you this flattened sense of space. 
it becomes a memory game. Speaking of memory, of where is that under the menu? What is the key command? You don't use the software for a while, you forget. It's not like riding a bike, you can just pick it up again. I haven't used Flash in years. I, I don't even want to pick it up again because I can't remember where things are. And it's just, it's, it's very mind. You have to be going in the back of your mind to remember how to, where things are. There's been this uh, disturbing trend in, in automobiles that it becomes this giant smartphone on wheels. Out of a sudden, you have the you are bringing that flat, that sense of flattened space to the car, which you're you're not supposed to be looking, you're not supposed to be thinking, where's that in the main? Where do I turn up my 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 temperature and, and where do I do that? And I know some things are right there, but you still have to look and you have to think about where they are. Which is not ideal for the car. I don't think you do a good point, but I will say that if you can imagine that as a whole lot easier than an unfold. Oh, definitely. I'm not saying that this is all bad, because <laughs> you can still see a big map and you know it's there, you don't have to be looking down to the little screen on your phone. But if you're trying to create an, an action like enter an address and type things in, that's not ideal. So there's always a there's always a middle ground. I'm not saying that screens are bad, vision's bad. But I think that there's been a lot of reliance on solely that and not other things, other senses. So visibility. So this is about how much of watching somebody perform an activity helps people learn about that activity. So we as humans, we model other people's activities. There's been a, a study done on uh, perf human performance on a help desk on a, on a particular help desk company, and the most experienced person sat next to the novice person, and it turned out that the novice person became the second most experienced person in a little bit of time, because he was sitting right next to the expert guy, and he could hear how he was answering the calls, he could hear what he was saying to the, the customers, and he picked that up just by listening and watching. So we humans, we model other people's behaviors as a way to learn. If we look at our Graphical user interfaces, there is this invisibility of work practice. The practice of an expert and the pr practice of novice, it looks the same. I don't look at some amazing designer working on the computer, and I'm like, he's great. You know, you, can't, you really can't tell, or I can just peripherally watch as a way to learn. I have to you know, look, look at the screen, see what's going on there. So there's no mechanism to be aware of the practice of experts because it all looks the same. And one of the rarely considered aspects of interaction design is in the way in which it enables this peripheral participation. It is personal, as you know, as I said earlier with the PC, it's, it becomes really personal. It's not so much about this shared experience, and I can't really learn by watching somebody. There are interfaces, of course, that bridge the physical and the digital, such as the React table, which was this musical uh, table top surface done by a university in Barcelona, Spain. It was performed by Icelandic um, singer Bjork, even. She was the first one to take this on stage and, and perform with it. And, even, uh, and the audience could see even more like what, what she was doing, because there was a big projection a camera on top of this, of this uh, surface. So in the idea of co-located studios is also a way to, uh, a way to be more open about um, critiques of work in progress and having these artifacts that are always there. And, and since people are working in the same room, you know, we, we're seeing a lot more of that happening here at Microsoft, the open spaces putting down walls, so it just uh, it enables this, this participation, this peripheral participation. And there's also the great aspect of the visibility of a creative performance. Even though we know that studio recordings are way higher quality than a live performance, people still pack concerts to go see a band perform live because they want to be a, they want to be co-authors of that experience. They want that back and forth. They want to see being being done right in front of them. Versus if you go to a electronic music concert sometimes, you see a person on a t-shirt behind a screen and and then there's the audience becomes disengaged sometimes and they become dubious. They they start asking themselves, are they 
mixing live or are they checking their email? You guys here are old enough to remember Millie Vanilli? I did not tell that joke at a high state because they were just so young. Right? They're like, they're not going to know even who Millie Vanilli was. But it was such a riot that those guys were lip syncing and people were just so angry at them and they lost their Grammy. It was a huge deal that they weren't doing that thing live. But now with electronic music, we have and this is a personal passion of mine, is how do you get the musician from behind the screen and showing what they're doing and bringing the audience in as, a, as participants. So tangibility, we've been touching glass a lot. All the surfaces we interact with are mostly glass. And glass, you know, you don't, you don't, and the glass that we use for our devices is not even it doesn't even have the properties of glass that it can warm up and, and things like that. It's just cold glass. And touch really impacts our cognition and the impression of the, of the world around us. There's been a study done uh, for the 2011 Journal of Science that they, they, they were testing people buying cars. And, and they were putting some, like half the people in a very stiff, uncomfortable seat and half people in the very comfortable seat with nice materials and everything. And they found that the people on the stiff seats, they were holding, holding off for as little as 2% versus the people in the comfortable seat. They're like, oh, that's fine. You know, it just puts them in a different space. Just the fact that they were touching those materials versus being in a cold, uncomfortable seat affected how they were perceiving the world around them. So it's another opportunity as we think of uh, interfaces we can design. If everything we're touching is glass, people are going to end up being cranky after a while. Versus that if we can have these diff different physical, tactile experience, they're going to trigger people unconscious thoughts, emotions, and behaviors. The car is a great example of a, a tactile interface. Because I can feel this just by the way the steer steering wheel feels in my hand. I can feel the surface of the road. I can feel uh, the, the torque. I can feel. I can feel all kinds of. Uh, I can feel even on my on my pedals. I can feel if the surface of the road is rough, and I can if my ABS system kicks in. I can feel the my brakes kind of telling me to back off. So there's a lot of cues that we take in with our body that doesn't have have to necessarily be through the visual. The thing about putting a huge screen there is that then the only way you can take things in is through the visual. And you, you, have, you have to take advantage of your body, especially in a, in a driving situation. This is an example from my own car. I have a Honda Fit. And I actually didn't even notice until I started you know, thinking of this line of research of the attention to detail they have on the physicality of the buttons, for instance. The button on the very end has a rounded, a rounded edge. There is a groove between each of the buttons, so I can feel as I, as I pass my hand through it. Some buttons are concave, others are convex. I look at it once, I look at it maybe twice, and then I, I just know how to use it because I can feel it. If, whether if it, was all, if it was all glass, then I wouldn't be, I wouldn't be having that, that feel. Uh, when I was presenting this at Ohio State, I asked all the students to close their eyes and find keys in their bags, which is pretty easy. And then ask them to close their eyes, get their smartphone, go into Facebook, and post, I am cool. They really tried for actually quite a while. <laughs> just fun to watch. They're great. Um, they you know, just make the point that there's no, you don't get the, the physicality. that you, you can just do it without looking. You have to look. So we looked at uh, five different types of physical thinking, physical activity, expert performance, physical space, uh, visibility of practice and tangibility. And we think, as we've been talking about, we think humans think with our whole body. So it follows that in interfaces we create should follow this shift in thinking. So the question is, how can we improve how humans interact with technology by embracing embodied cognition? Embracing the fact that our body helps our cognition the same way that our, our mind influences our body. So it's one, one system. And we know that the more we engage the body, the more humans think. If I'm trying to memorize something by sitting down with my, my hands crossed, it's going to be way harder than if I'm moving around, if I'm thinking of in a, in a space. And if we can 
amplify through technology, if we can have th these tools that blend body and mind and get them to work uh, together and seamlessly, it's just going to offer um, endless possibilities. Uh, and, and as designers, and I, I call everybody here, everybody, I have a Microsoft employee in my view as a designer, we need to make technology elevate what it is to be human and not make, it used to be that we had to learn how to speak to the machine. And now I think the technology and the sensor, the sensor technology is to the point that we can make technology and elevate our essence of being human. And to the, to the point about natural user interfaces, watch how people do things in the world and then use emerging technologies to enable those more interactions. And I just list a few there just to, to give a few examples, but there's so many more um, types of technologies that can uh, allow these natural interactions. And think beyond the screen. Even though a lot of what we do here is screen, I want us to be thinking what is beyond what is beyond the screen? The screen will always be there. I'm not saying screen is bad, pixels are bad, heresy. I'm not saying any of that. It's, it's great. We will need displays. Displays will always be there. But is, are the displays the end all be all? Or what is beyond the, the screen? What is, is, what is making a system with the screen that works together? Uh, so we are, you know, the, the point here is that we're trying to engage more of the human senses. As, we, as you see, the way we interact with our screen is very limited from a human perspective. So how can we engage more senses and thus help people think, communicate, and express themselves better? And uh, these emerging technologies have to, the ability to reunite mind and body. It used to be all about the body. We went up to our minds. We haven't really gotten down to integrating everything again as a, as a human, human is capable of. So now we are, it's the post-GUI era. Um, it's, the, it's the ubiquitous computing. We've, we've eliminated the interface as we know it. There's a lot of talk about the invisible interface. And all these devices, a lot of them don't, have, don't necessarily have a screen. And that's why I went to Ohio State in 2005 saying I was starting to see some of those and I said this is it's going to be huge for, for designers and for people in technology. Because the graphical user interface when it came out in 81, I believe, you know, there was a lot of conventions that were created, the icons and the desktop and folders and, and things like that. So what are the new conventions that are going to come with this new set of devices? How do I know that this chair is not sensing my, my presence right now? And if it is digitally activated, how do, I, how do I talk to it? Like, do I come to it? Is it going to light up? Do I poke it? Do I, is there an on, on button or something? So there's just a lot of different ways you, you interact with it. Do I say, OK, chair? You know, there's just these new conventions that are starting to show up. So this is an interesting uh, space for us, as, us all as designers to be thinking about. This was actually stolen from Bill Buxton's talk, by the way. He gave this amazing talk at uh, TechFest, I think, last year, Designing for Ubiquitous Computing. And he had this slide. And these are two points that he makes on his talk, is that it's, um, it became the baseline that the products should work and have great, great flow. At first, it would be just like, it works. It's amazing. I can say, hello, world. And it shows up over there. And it's amazing that it works. And then the iPhone came out, and then you had these fluid experiences and now it has to work and it has to flow. But now that you have this, this uh, plethora of devices that are all interconnected, it's not just about introducing a new device or a new service. It's about the, whatever you introduce reduces the complexity and increases the value of everything else and things work together as a system. So the good example is the phone and the car, you know, the car, car with Ford Sync and the phone with Bluetooth enabled. You can go from interacting with your phone, which is mostly visual, uses the Metro design language, and you use touch, and you can, you can swipe, and you can talk to it. And it goes from that visual interface to when you're, you go into your car, the car becomes the interface. And you're no longer looking at the screen. But you can enter the car speaking on your phone. The car picks it up. It knows you're there. It knows the phone has been previously paired. You put your phone away. You go drive, you're still talking, but you're not interacting with the phone. But you're still going through that scenario 
when you come to your destination, let's say you're still talking, you park your car, you turn it off, you pick up your phone, the phone is aware that the car was turned off. So it just works as a system instead of being a phone and a car and you have to do something for them to work to that. It was, it was thought of as a system that goes from one to the next and back to, back to one. So my challenge that I gave to the students and that I give to everyone is to not be constrained by our current interaction conventions. It is changing, is it about to change? And I think it's up to us to create the next paradigm in, th in embracing embodied cognition, the fact that we we don't think with just our minds. We're way more than what's, what's up here. Our bodies are capable of a lot of sensing and, and expressing. So what is the next paradigm once we start seeing body and mind as one? When we start looking at users as humans. I don't even like the word user experience design because user sounds really cold. So user one, user two. And when we do usability studies, like participant one, and it sounds pretty cold. And it's about the human and what we're capable of as, as human beings and what our, our bodies are capable of. Thank you. I have a blog where I blog about these um, interfaces that are beyond what we're, we're traditionally seeing. Um, there's Twitter, and I want to op open for questions. I have my references here at the end of this talk. I'm referencing a couple of the, connect couple of the connecting series that it's actually done by Microsoft, the, the Windows Phone people. The talk by Bill Buxton, Designing for Ubiquitous Computing, that was given here at TechFest. There's this paper, that, the How Bodies Matter, from uh, Stanford that came out a long, quite a long time ago. It's been referenced and referenced and has a lot of these, these thoughts in there. Jody Medic, who used to work here, has left, also has a lot of this, uh, this thinking. Thank you. Any questions? It could always change and update and get a new feature and you could introduce it. So how do you sort of reconcile that benefit with screen rings with the fact that when you make a physical object, I mean, a car is fine because everything is set in stone. You're never going to need to do anything other than temperatures and volume and whatever. But mm -hmm. you know, how do you sort of like have these more tactile experiences but maintain the sort of modularity that the, that the touch screen brought? That's a great question. And there's actually a lot of papers that are questioning the, the tangible user interfaces, saying that they're very limited because they're tangible. I think it's a matter of creating these systems that bridge the physical and the digital. Because the digital has this capacity of being modular. You can add to it. And the physical is, is limited. It's physical. But it, so there are pros and cons to both. I, I don't think it's, it's, the answer is being about being just, just digital or going all the way to the physical. It's about finding that the middle ground, like how do you add digital capabilities to physical objects, or how do you bring more physical aspects to our digital ex experiences? Do you think there's kind of a future generalized tactile interface like the touch screen that we might? I don't, I don't think there's one yet. I don't know if there will be. I think it's our, our job to figure that out. I don't know if there will be one, one generalized one. If, if you have thoughts, I'd love to know. That's that's top of mind for me too. We saw yep. Big Hero Six actually has a pretty good take on uh, generalized sort of material output sort of technology. But um, one thing that occurred to me was the sort of de-physicalization of intellectual work. It seems to me like it goes back far before the mainframe era, actually going back to scribes and the creation of sort of written culture or clarity class that focused on. Consuming and creating something purely mental, um, and so I'm sort of wondering how, um, you know, whether our computers aren't that way anymore because the tradition goes back to, you know, all of sort of digital history or the history of sort of written work. Mm -hmm. Whether you're actually calling for generalizing the kinds of work that we do beyond the kinds of work that are best done in that sort of generally mental language processing way. Mm -hmm.
purchase order is, is pretty intangible. The but concept here is. But, but the question is more, yes, that's true, but, how, but nonetheless, how can you map that into space and into body you know, concepts that have some sort of physical interactability? It doesn't have to be. Like, there's some old concepts where to print stuff, you would take like a little marble and go to the printer and put it there. Like a, going through the UI and sending a document, which is interesting. It can incorporate this into the object. Yeah, to your point. I think it's, a, it's, a, it's about finding, it's not about forcing something, because I think right now we're, we're kind of forced into the screen interaction. So it's like, yeah, I, can t I can take a marble somewhere and drop it, and that's, that's a way of inputting stuff into the system versus clicking an icon. I think it's a matter of exper experimenting with what is, that, what is that line, and what are the things that are, some things are good for some things, other things are good for some other things. I'm not sure if I answered your question at all. Okay. I thought it was an observation. Mm -hmm. uh, I have a quick question about the mapping limitations of the screen and how they fit in with the various external features of the human body. Do you know what is being measured in this case? I don't know. I actually don't know. It looked like temperature to me. It seemed so like, I was I, that was my guess was the heat. It was like a heat map. I'm not sure if they were measuring some other electrical signals or anything like that. Yeah, everybody gets intrigued by that picture. Yeah. Yeah, it's very intriguing. I, know, I, was, like, really, I was intrigued by that picture, but I couldn't quite immediately make the leap to like, hmm, what kind of interfaces would make use of that? Mm -hmm. Like, show how your body interacts with this? Yeah, it was more just to say that people don't process things just in their minds. Mm -hmm. Or people say, oh, I love you with my, all my heart. But it's like, it's really with all your body. <laughs> You know, that's why maybe we should change that phrase. But there's this uh, the idea that people process thought with just their minds. And, you know, sometimes you think of something, it gives you goosebumps or it gives you stomach aches. And, you know, it's just that the whole, you think and it creates something physical, and then something physical creates a thought. That was the, the point of that, uh, that image. So what about the idea of an interface where you use your chi? Your what? Your chi? <laughs> wow, I want to work with you. <laughs> that sounds very futuristic. <laughs> comments? Any more comments, questions? Email, yeah, feel free to email my alias is Melissa Q. Uh, if you have any, you know, projects, cool ideas, thoughts. Thank you. Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available.